Hat got smashed in one of the moves, and these things cost like a hundred bucks to replace, so... Uh, yeah, it's gonna have to deal with it. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. This month, however, is Doctor Who's 60th anniversary, and as a result, we're gonna be having some fun. So yeah, sorry that Secret Origins Month is getting put off again, but you're still gonna have a fun theme month this time. Last year, I did a Patreon viewer's choice for a Doctor Who review, and you guys chose Legopolis. Despite some copyright issues, which hopefully won't affect this one, it was a lot of fun, and it's only appropriate we do it again for this big anniversary. This time, the voting was for Dalek and Cybermen stories, since I feared putting one of those on that list would have given it all the votes. So yeah, we're gonna have some comic reviews this month, but let's start things off with how it all started. Started. But not really. Sort of. Let me explain. Today's episode is from Season 25, the second to last of Classic Who. It's also one of the best seasons of the show, and while another story that was up for voting, Silver Nemesis, is the official 25th anniversary story, they got the season off to a bang with this one, wherein the Doctor returns to 1963, Coal Hill School, and 76 Totters Lane, all elements from the very first episode of the show. This is also a Dalek story, and I don't think we've ever actually properly talked about the Daleks before, so for anyone out there unfamiliar with them, here's the deal. They're alien space tanks for little blobs and are filled with hate for anything unlike them, vowing total extermination of all other life. And their backstory is relevant here, so let's get into that too. Once upon a time, on the planet Skaro, there were two races of humanoids, the Khaleds and the Thals. For whatever reason, the two races went to war. Over a thousand years of fighting to the point where even they forgot why they were doing it. Though apparently an early draft of the original Dalek story would have revealed that some other third party had gotten them to fight each other, and they were coming back at the end to say whoopsie. And a thousand years of nuclear war takes its toll on the planet. The college's chief scientist, a scarred and damaged man named Davros, realized that the rising amount of radiation was going to mutate the Khaled race. Believing there was no hope for their species as it was, he conducted experiments to accelerate that mutation and evolution, and consequently create travel machines for them. The Daleks. However, the Khaleds were also space Nazis. And that's not in a, oh, they were generic fascists. No, no. The mindset of the Daleks and the Khaleds, as depicted on Doctor Who, was directly drawing upon the Nazis. Anyway, because the Khaleds were about genetic purity and believed that all other life was inferior to them, Davros's experiments instilled that same massive racial hatred into his creations. With his primitive but powerful Daleks, Davros was able to exterminate most of the Thals and consequently take control of the remaining Khaled's, only for the Daleks to turn on him, since of course in proper hubris-laden mad scientist fashion, he programmed the Daleks to believe that no other beings were superior to them not recognizing that that included him. That wasn't the end for Davros, though, as he then consequently reappeared in every classic Dalek story afterwards, something we would have gotten into if another of the voting options, Destiny of the Daleks, had been chosen. And that was kind of a problem for the show, because it reduced the menace of the Daleks to either being servants of Davros, or at least making their plots all about him. Not that they couldn't still be good stories, but it upset fans that he became the central focus of Dalek stories, which is important for us to also understand why remembrance of the Daleks is so good. This episode wasn't supposed to be on the voting list. Originally in its place was Revelation of the Daleks, a Sixth Doctor story that I personally don't like, but then I realized the other choices all had major continuity or anniversary references and was like, well, let's keep that streak going. I'm not upset about the choice, it's just people prefer me talking about good stuff sometimes, and Remembrance of the Daleks is one of the best stories of Classic Who. Hell, to make it all about me for a second, I think think Remembrance of the Daleks was the very first Doctor Who story I ever saw. It's hard to remember exact details when it was when I was three years old, but it's definitely the earliest I ever remember watching. Sylvester McCoy is my Doctor, my first and favorite. While he gets played up nowadays as this massive chess master, manipulating his foes so that they destroy themselves, it's often forgotten that in the actual show, that didn't happen all the time. He was still in the dark on plenty of occasions, and his first season was a bit rough as he just kind of stumbled into situations as is usual for the character. The way people talk up the Seventh Doctor, you'd think that he had built this great big engine that was time and space, that he set every piece into motion and let it run, able to make all his enemies destroy themselves at every opportunity, 
while forgetting that one of the first character traits they established about him was that he liked to play the spoons. Now, those elements are certainly there, and we'll definitely be seeing them in the story, but I think that sometimes people forget that he's still the doctor, he still cares about people, still says goofy things on occasion, and he's still a bit of a clown, even though he's not dressed like one anymore. Today's episode brings the Doctor back to where he began, a junkyard in 1963 London. As I said in the Legopolis review, it wasn't actually that frequent for Classic Who to make a lot of continuity references. So while they drop a few little hints here and there, like the location, there won't be any specific mention of stuff like the Doctor's granddaughter Susan, or the two missing school teachers who he kinda kidnapped. So let's dig into Remembrance of the Daleks, and enjoy one of my favorite episodes of the show. In an unusual turn for Classic Who, we begin not with the theme song, but a pullback from Earth to reveal an alien spaceship approaching, ominous music playing, and various sound bites from 1963 playing, including stuff from JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. I don't really get it. I mean, it's a very cinematic kind of opening, establishing the weirdness of a spaceship approaching Earth in that year, but no other episode of Doctor Who opened like that. But anyway, theme song. I frickin' love this one, the Kef McCulloch version. While the tune used from the late 4th Doctor through the 6th Doctor felt like an 80s rockin' guitar, this one felt like it was distinctly 80s with its synthesizer usage, an otherworldly sound of it. Sure, I love full orchestral versions and rock versions and all that, but sometimes you just want something that sounds weird. This opening theme also has the unique quality of including the middle eight, the part of the theme song with the kind of sweeping heroic melody and usually only included in the ending theme. The purple galaxy swirl is also something new and different for the theme, and features the TARDIS flying around, something that would become common in New Who theme songs. No idea what the hell the deal is with the three CGI asteroid chunks just flying in there, but it looks cool. Unfortunately, the logo leaves something to be desired. While the previous theme resembled the 80s with its kind of neon piping look, this one looks more dated with the weird combination of the cursive Doctor and then Big Who in a different font. I don't hate it, but it is kind of goofy compared to other other logos in the show's history. The Doctor and his companion, Ace, have arrived just outside of Coal Hill School in 1963. Ace's backstory is complicated, but to make a long story short, she's an 80s teenager, a bit of a punk, has an attitude, and she has an affinity for explosives. She is my favorite classic Who companion, and of course, people who have seen this episode know why. We'll get to it. Ace notices a little blonde girl staring at the two of them, wondering what she's looking at. Your clothing's a little anachronistic for this time period. Good thing that question mark patterns are timeless. The Doctor takes notice of a van with an antenna on top of it, while Ace just wants to get some food. However, the Doctor bumps into Ace's backpack. You're not carrying any nitronine explosives in there. No. Those I keep in my jacket pockets. He sends Ace off to a cafe to get some food while he continues studying the aerial, noting that it's pretty advanced tech for 1963. Not anachronistic, just not something you'd normally see on the streets. At the cafe, Ace meets a guy named Mike who helps her with the order while the little girl returns to stare at the doctor until he goes into the school courtyard. She runs off from playing hopscotch and he makes note of the four strange burn marks on the ground. And the girl? Seven, eight, it's a doctor. 
the gate. Okay, kid, you're doing the Freddy Krueger nursery rhyme all wrong. Deciding to take more direct action, the doctor enters the back of the van and meets Professor Rachel Jensen. She is, of course, confused by the weird little man who just came in, but is accepting of him since he seems to know what he's talking about. But there's a strange magnetic fluctuation in the area, a signal that's artificial in origin. Before she can inquire any more, though, the van is summoned to 76 Totters Lane, the junkyard where the TARDIS was originally located in the first episode of Doctor Who. Mike and Ace join them before they leave, revealing that Mike is actually an army sergeant. I know nothing! Nothing about the British military, so I'm assuming there's a logical reason why he's just running around in a bomber jacket and not a uniform that you guys will tell me all about in the comments. At Totters Lane, we're introduced to Group Captain Gilmore, the man in charge of the military forces. Rachel vouches for the doctor, and they're shown a dead soldier with no external sign of injuries. The doctor examines him and quickly realizes what happened. His insides were scrambled. Very nasty. Have you ever tried to pee out of your pituitary gland before? Only an energy weapon could have done the job, to the disbelief of the others. We meet another member of the team, Allison, while the doctor confirms that whatever shot at the soldier is trapped in a shed with only one way in or out that they are guarding. Reinforcements arrive, but the Doctor has already deduced what it is that they're fighting, and they need to pull back lest more are killed. And that quickly happens. Some soldiers try to drag the dead body away, only for one to be shot and blasted back. And amusingly, even after 25 years at that point, Doctor Who continuity was strangely on point when it came to Dalek sound effects. Their bases or ships having a consistent background noise, and for giving some minor variations or a few stories where it's absent, the sound of the Dalek gun. One thing I really like about the Dalek vision in this episode that makes it kind of unique is this shot here. The faces of the soldiers are completely blank. Sure, it's probably more a result of it scanning through a wall or the like, but it also reflects how the Daleks see other living beings. Faceless, interchangeable, irrelevant. It dehumanizes them to just being a vague shape without identity, and therefore unworthy of any such specific identification. The only one we do see with a face later from this vision is the Doctor, who of course they need to recognize as he's their greatest enemy. Anyway, the Doctor reiterates that the army can't handle this. Listen to me, Brigadier. And that's not just funny because of the Doctor's history, but what's fun about this as a 25th anniversary story is that this episode is kind of a throwback to the third Doctor's unit stories. The disbelieving army commander, the doctor taking charge or giving advice. Rachel can be thought of as a take on Liz Shaw, and we've even got a supporting character named Mike. Anyway, Gilmore's next plan is to fire rifle grenades into the shed. It makes a nice kaboom, but another attempted blast from the Dalek shows that it of course survived and soon reveals itself. This is also a good chance to talk about the music. Kef McCulloch also did the incidental music, and it's very much of its time. The synthesizer strikes and beats are similar to what you'd hear in certain 80s direct-to-video fare. I personally really like it, and he knows how to get really tense with it, but I get why others may find it distracting because it seems a bit dated now. Anyway, the lone Dalek is, of course, making quick work of the army, so the Doctor needs to handle this. Peace! Give me some of that Nitro 9 that you're not carrying. And another! Unfortunately, the Doctor didn't actually know what they were and thought they were energy drinks. He lures the Dalek over to the timed explosives and makes it go kablammo. While Rachel and the others examine the Dalek's remains, the Doctor and Ace borrow their van to return to Coal Hill School. The Doctor gives Ace, and consequently anyone in the audience not familiar with them, the exposition about the Daleks. Ace thinks this means that they're out to conquer the Earth, but, as the Doctor points out, that'd be a bit redundant. The Daleks conquered the Earth in the 22nd century in the second Dalek story ever. Mind you, they also got forced off of Earth and then conquered it a second time in Day of the Daleks, and let's not forget all the Dalek invasions in New Who, but the point is, that's not what they're after. The Doctor says they're here for the Hand of Omega, which we'll explain what that is later. However, he notes one thing of interest here. He says that it's the wrong Daleks. More on that later, too. At the Army HQ, Mike introduces Group Captain Gilmore to a local businessman, Mr. Ratcliffe. He's brought some of his men. I think they can be of some use to us. Okay, again, ignorant American here. Did the British military usually subcontract out work to local businesses if they needed men? Rachel and Allison lament that they're not sure what course of action to recommend, especially since they don't know anything about the Doctor. Yet he's more knowledgeable about Daleks than them. I could question how they know the word Dalek, since the Doctor only yelled it once in the middle of loud gunfire far away from them, but I guess Rachel just has good ears. 
When I get hold of him, I'm going to get some answers out of him. Okay, so a kind of critique of the story. No, she does not. In fact, despite this featuring a fairly popular supporting cast, said cast does not actually do much in this story. The human villains do, of course, but Rachel and Allison? Even they'll later comment that they feel kind of useless in this situation. Group Captain Gilmore is around to facilitate the military and clear things for the Doctor to do his thing, but otherwise doesn't really contribute much. What helps make them work, though, are great performances by all the actors and some memorable dialogue. Sometimes the supporting cast don't need arcs or anything, they just need to support the story, and they do that. In fact, these characters would actually come back as a pre-unit group called Countermeasures in Big Finish Audio, because it's big finish there is not a piece of doctor who lore that they can't milk a spin-off out of and yet i am still waiting for the third charlie pollard series damn it and that's a testament to their potential as characters even if they weren't fully realized here anyway at the school the doctor and ace are once again observed by the blonde girl as they meet with the headmaster the doctor wants to have a look around and at first the headmaster refuses but then suddenly touches his ear and tells him it's fine. While the military learn of the Doctor and Ace's whereabouts, we see that Mr. Ratcliffe's men have killed the soldiers guarding the Dalek and are taking its remains away. Back at the school, Ace notes that the Doctor was expecting the Daleks, with him admitting that they're following him, somehow. After Ace does her best Carol Ann Ford impression, seriously, she studied how Susan held this book in the original pilot to try to mimic her, the Doctor notes the burn marks in the courtyard, getting Ace to deduce that they're actually landing points for some kind of spacecraft. Although she notes that she thinks that she'd have heard about aliens in 1963. Do you remember the Zygon Gambit with the Loch Ness Monster? Or the Yetis in the Underground? Nah, she hasn't had a chance to listen to the latest indie bands, Doctor. Fun continuity nods and the fact that Earth has been visited by aliens multiple times and nobody knew about it. It's why it was kind of fun that New Who had their own versions of aliens becoming fact for humanity in the present day before Stephen Moffat hit the reset button on it. But anyway, on the continuity front, he mentions the Hand of Omega again, something that he left behind in 1963 when he was there as the first Doctor. At Ratcliffe's business, he meets with a figure hidden from us operating some kind of computer. He asks it what the Dalek is. A machine. A tool. Nothing more. What, don't you have a death ray setting on your socket wrench? Anyway, our heroes head down to the school cellar and discover a Dalek transmat. Doctor Who's version of the transporter. A Dalek is getting beamed down from orbit, but the Doctor screws with it to stop it. I persuaded one half of the Dalek to materialize where his other half was materializing. The two halves tried to coexist at the same point. Enterprise. What we got back didn't live long. Fortunately. The doctor says he's only temporarily disabled it until whoever was operating the transmat comes to repair it. Which, as Ace notes, would be another Dalek. Stay where you are! Do not move! So this is something that can't necessarily be appreciated by a modern audience that never watched Classic Who, because when the Daleks came back in the new series, they addressed it right away. Daleks and stairs. It was the recurring gag of anyone watching. Hell, they even made fun of it in the show once in the previously mentioned Destiny of the Daleks. If you're supposed to be the superior race of the universe, why don't you try climbing after us? For 25 years on screen, Daleks can't go upstairs. Doctor yelling to run to the stairs is the best strategy. Sure, we could probably assume they could. We had seen Davros kind of, sort of, hovering in a terrible process shot in Revelation of the Daleks. But Davros is not the Daleks, and, well, just look at it. Not exactly the kind of thing to get kids running behind the sofa in fear. But imagine you're a longtime fan of Doctor Who watching the season 25 premiere. Doctor and Ace run up the stairs, the door is locked, Ace is knocked down, and then... This. You are the enemy of the Daleks! One of, if not the best cliffhanger in Doctor Who. Chef's Kiss. Perfect. Great way to start the season. We open part two with Ace recovering and headbutting the headmaster, quickly unlocking the door and getting the doctor out of there. The doctor is nothing if not sympathetic to life, so he pulls the headmaster out of the line of fire, but spots some kind of mind control chip behind his ear and our heroes head off. They run into the soldier with the anti-tank rockets that Group Captain Gilmore had sent to the school, and while something that happens later in this episode is probably the most iconic Ace moment, let's not pretend that she doesn't have a lot of moments in this story. And shock of all shocks, 
rockets. One involves those anti-tank rockets. Also, points to Group Captain Gilmore for recognizing our bullets didn't work. Let's get something designed to blow up tanks. The Headmaster is ordered by the Dalek to repair the transmat while it returns to the main level. Back with the Doctor. You'll have to sign for them, sir. So, this guy saw this weirdo wearing a vest with question marks all over it and said to himself, Yeah, this is probably the guy who can sign for the explosive weaponry. But that's okay, it's the teenage girl who uses it to blow up the Dalek. Gilmore and the rest of the military forces come in to help secure the school. The Doctor, upon examining this destroyed Dalek, realizes he's made a mistake and asks the group captain to evacuate the area. He still doubts that the Daleks are alien, but Rachel has to sadly confirm it for him and they agree to follow the Doctor's lead for now. And the Doctor is leading nothing, telling Ace to stay put while he goes off to deal with some things on his own, taking her baseball bat with him. The Doctor remembered that his softball team was playing before he had to leave in the first episode. Mike invites Ace to stay at his mother's boarding house overnight. The Doctor has a brief scene with a worker at the cafe. It's not really plot relevant or anything, but it's a nice quiet moment for the Doctor to reflect on the consequences of his actions. The manipulations and choices he makes that can create a massive difference in history, especially if things go wrong. In the documentary More Than 30 Years in the TARDIS, Colin Baker discussed how the Doctor's morality is not really about making a consistent choice over and over, but rather he finds an injustice and he has to set it right somehow. Now, setting it right doesn't necessarily mean everyone is happy and prosperous, just that it needs to be made right. If people are oppressed, he must free them from oppression. If someone is murdered, the murderer must be brought to justice. If the innocent are suffering, he must save them. And we see that throughout the course of Doctor Who, both New Who and the classic series, that sometimes his actions end up making things worse. It's not intentional, but ultimately he believes that wrongs must be righted, and you have to hope that you're making the right call just like anybody else. As the cafe worker says, Life's like that. Best thing is just to get on with it. Which I'm sure all of you are asking me to do, but with all these tangents. As always, though, it's my show, and if there's one trait I share with the Doctor, it's that I can talk. But back at the school, it seems the headmaster was able to repair the transmat because Daleks start materializing there again the next morning. The Doctor, in the meantime, heads to a mortuary. He comes to claim the Hand of Omega, hidden inside of a casket, though he takes a moment to put Ace's bat inside of it because... Uh... Chess master? After Ace flirts with Mike, who informs her he needs to go do some stuff for the Association, aka Mr. Ratcliffe's group, the Doctor takes the casket with him. Follow me. The Hand of Omega is actually the Time Lord's Amazon drone delivery system. He brings the hand to a cemetery plot cared for by a blind minister, and we learn that the Doctor had indeed planned on burying it here before the start of the show. Oh, and hey, a floating casket! So my Takano in the Ring franchise was actually afraid of the Hand of Omega this whole time. Kudos to the effects team on this, by the way. It's not perfect, obviously, but honestly, the floating box isn't too bad for something shot on video in the 80s. Mike follows the Doctor on Ratcliffe's orders, but he's soon attacked by the mind-controlled Headmaster. He wants to know the location of the renegade Dalek base, but Mike has no idea what he's talking about. Mike is also a young soldier, whereas the Headmaster is an out-of-shape old guy, so things are very quickly turned around. However, to avoid their agent accidentally spilling anything, the Daleks controlling him kill him remotely. All we learn is that the renegade Daleks have defied the will of the Emperor Dalek. How do the Daleks decide who gets to be their leader when they're all programmed to act the same way? Do, like, they have elections where some have slogans like, I hate other beings more than my opponent! Or just, like, whichever Dalek mutant grows too big for its normal casing gets the job. Anyway, Mike apparently found the Doctor wandering around and brings him to the boarding house. They're summoned to group Captain Gilmore, but Mike wants Ace to stay put for her safety, which the Doctor agrees with, but does give her the Hand of Omega charged baseball bat, which makes little cartoon special effects. Back with Ratcliffe, the person in the chair tells them that the Imperial Daleks are going to start moving and he needs to be ready for war. Ratcliffe is enthusiastic, saying that Britain fought on the wrong side in the last war, meaning World War II. Yeah, he may not be wearing a red armband, but let's just say that Mr. Ratcliffe is a big Tiki Torch enthusiast. Over at the military HQ, Gilmore explains that the evacuation has been approved and a cover story made. He hands control over to the doctor, saying that he's putting his career at risk with this, so he'd better deliver. With respect, Captain, your career is magnificently irrelevant. You look so sad about that. Did you really think the doctor would be interested in his career? 
I want a direct line to Jodrell Bank. One of my previous incarnations is going to die there in 20 years, and I want to set up a big cushion for me to land on. While I start searching for the coordinates of the Dalek ship in orbit, as well as telling the troops not to engage any Daleks that might be encountered, we cut back over to the boarding house. Ace is disgusted to find a no colors sign in the window of the boarding house and decides to leave for the school, since she left her boombox there earlier. Also on the TV... With an adventure in the new science fiction series, Dr. Ah yes, Dr. Telegram. 90% of its episodes were junked. Back at the military HQ, they've found the coordinates of the Dalek mothership, but more importantly, the Doctor has had Mike and Allison collect a bunch of junk parts for him to assemble a more practical weapon to use against the Dalek ground forces. He also reveals to the others that he thinks they're dealing with two warring Dalek factions, and they need to contain them, keep them focused on each other instead of on them. Otherwise, the Daleks are so powerful, they may decide to just slaughter everyone in the area to find the Hand of Omega. At the school, Ace finds her boombox and turns on the radio, but ends up picking up the Dalek transmissions. Namely, that a force of them are now in the school with her. Back with the Doctor, he finishes up his device, mentioning that he had rigged something like it up in the episode Planet of the Daleks. Although ironically, this device looks more convincing than it can do the job, since in that episode, he basically did it with a tape recorder. Gilmore reports that he's lost contact with his men at the school, so the Doctor tells him to ready plastic explosives, since... Well, the device he's made is only going to disorient them, not kill them. However, they quickly get moving when Mike learns that Ace left the boarding house a while ago. And thus we reach the defining moment of this episode for Ace's character, and just a wonderful one for Doctor Who history. At the school, a Dalek enters the chemistry lab, spots the boombox playing music, and blasts it. The Daleks aren't big Queen fans, sadly. It announces to its fellows that a small human female was seen on that level. Now, I'm not going to say that Ace would have single-handedly ended the time war if she had been there, but I'm saying it's possible. Jokes and memes aside, even empowered by the Hand of Omega, it's still a baseball bat against a group of alien tanks, so after some stunt work, Ace is surrounded in our next cliffhanger. It's quickly resolved by the Doctor arriving with his gun powered by Disco, which disorients the Daleks long enough for Ace to get away, and for Mike to plant some explosives to destroy them. There are living beings in there. Doctor, you're the one who told them to bring the plastic explosives! However, when Rachel investigates one, she realizes the mutant inside of it is still alive. And it reaches out to try to strangle the Doctor. I guess that Dalek had some strong opinions about Radagast and the Hobbit films. Fortunately, Allison grabs the discarded baseball bat and gets to play Ace for a second to beat the creature to death. He notes to Rachel that the Imperial Daleks have mutated further than they were originally. The claw is just one addition, but now they have mechanical components added in. He then tends to Ace, whose leg was injured leaping through a window. When she mentions that the Daleks blew up her stereo, the doctor said that that's good. Thing is, he hadn't noticed that she left it behind, and it was dangerous for her to have done so. If it had been located by someone from the 60s who understood some of its principles, technology of the area could have been radically altered and happened 20 years too early. But even they, ruthless though they are, would think twice before making such a radical alteration to the timeline. Can't help but feel a little worthless that the Daleks wouldn't bat an eye to kill everyone in the area, despite that being a major change in the timeline. But oh my god! A boombox in 1963? Maximum extermination before the timeline changes! The Mothership prepares to send more Daleks down since they've lost contact with that squad, but the Doctor decides to slow them down a bit, smashing the transmat with Ace's bat. Aw, I never got a chance to joke that that's not a transmat. This is a transmat. Weapons. Always useless in the end. Well, one, it's intended as a sports tool, not a weapon. Two, it's not useless. You can still hit somebody with the stick and keep smashing the insides with that bit. Three, you got plenty of use out of it, dude, so weapons are still good before the end. You know, I think the real reason Ace left the doctor was because he kept breaking her stuff. Anyway, thanks to Mike spying, Mr. Ratcliffe heads to the grave where the Hand of Omega is and sticks a metal rod down into it because... I think he's trying to find out how deep it is? 
is? I have no idea, but jabbing it causes the hand to activate some kind of defensive surge, a power source that the Imperial Daleks are able to detect from orbit. At the cafe, everyone's taking a break for lunch, where our side characters express their frustrations over needing to take a backseat to the Doctor. As I said earlier, these characters may not do much in the story, but they are well-performed and they're written as real people would be, thrust into a situation that they're supposed to be the experts on, but are being shown that they know nothing compared to some space vagrant, as Rachel refers to him. We're reliant on the Doctor because only the Doctor knows what is going on. One of the reasons Remembrance is such a beloved classic Who tale is that it plays against audience expectations. One is via the battle computer Ratcliffe interacts with, but we'll talk about that more later. Another is that the Doctor is a very proactive force in this story. Instead of getting tossed around by the plot and reacting to the Daleks, he's actively fighting them, even expected them, and is utilizing his force of personality to take command of the situation. It was also common for classic Who Dalek stories to have the first episode cliffhanger be the reveal of the Daleks, even though it's not much of a shocking reveal when their name is in the damn title. Honestly, you'd probably have an easier time shocking people if your story was called Absence of the Daleks and they don't show up until the end of the entire episode. Instead, they move the Dalek reveal to earlier and show off how powerful and deadly it is killing several trained military personnel and surviving high-explosive grenades. It's not the Daleks at their scariest, but it's a good reminder of how these tin-plated pepper pots can still be a credible threat 25 years later. Anyway, Ratcliffe summons his men to dig up the Hand of Omega as the little girl from earlier sees them and watches. On the mothership, the Emperor Dalek is brought out, and if the Daleks are salt and pepper shakers, then this Emperor is an egg cup. I don't think any Dalek Emperor has beaten the original from Evil of the Daleks myself. Hard to top the huge, angular Dalek with a booming, slightly distorted voice that almost sounds like it's screaming. Doctor, you will obey. Anywho, since the transmat is out of action, the Emperor orders an assault shuttle to go down and retrieve the Hand of Omega. The Doctor tells Gilmore that they should set up a forward base at the school, with Rachel and Allison making a passing reference to the Quatermass experiment. I wish Bernard was here. British rocket group's got its own problems. So while the Daleks are invading, is there a plant guy running around or something? The Doctor tells Ace that protecting the school isn't actually important, and somehow knows that the renegade Daleks now have the Hand of Omega. I mean, Doctor Who apparently exists in-universe, so he probably just watched a rerun where he saw Ratcliffe taking it. But yeah, with the Renegades now in possession of it, the Imperials will be focused on that instead of the humans. Later, when they walk back, Ace wants to know why they're securing the school if it doesn't matter. Keeping an eye on Group Captain Chunky Gilmore. Well, the wise men call him Chunky, I have no idea. Yeah, because the rest of them all prefer creamy peanut butter. It's actually apparently an in-joke to the actor playing Gilmore misunderstanding something in the script, though why they decided to include this in the actual filming is anyone's guess. But yeah, the Doctor reveals that he's really just trying to keep the army busy so they don't get killed in the crossfire between the two Dalek factions. He also finally explains what the hell the Hand of Omega is. Omega was one of the founding members of Time Lord Society, a stellar engineer who created the black hole that serves as Gallifrey's main source of power. Omega would actually be an enemy that came back a couple of times in Doctor Who history, most notably in the 10th anniversary story, The Three Doctors. So this is technically more continuity drops in the episode. The Hand of Omega is a device that allows whoever controls it to literally manipulate stars, in particular their life cycles. While the Daleks have time travel, they don't have the raw power necessary to manipulate time the way the Time Lords do. The Hand of Omega will give them that power. You know, the Doctor had earlier explained that when he was last here in 1963, he left the Hand of Omega behind. Not by choice, since of course he was the first Doctor at the time and, well, things got kind of out of hand in the first episode. I mentioned in the Legopolis review that that episode had a bunch of lore drops about the TARDIS and the Doctor. Nothing concrete, but some new details like the Doctor had stolen the TARDIS and he had to leave for rather pressing reasons. This episode reveals that he took the Hand of Omega with him, and that makes me wonder if that was part of his decision to leave. The Time Lords, or someone else, had plans to use the Hand for something evil, and he refused to let that happen. Although in reality, behind Behind the scenes, this was all part of what became known as the Cartmel Master Plan. The Cartmel Master Plan was an attempt by some of the creative team behind Doctor Who at the time, led by script editor Andrew Cartmel, to reintroduce some mystery back into the Doctor because over the decades we learned more and more about him and Time Lord society. The idea was that he was actually one of the founding beings of said society, reborn through 
We'll ask Diamanda Hagen sometime about Time Lord looms, and she'll talk your ear off about them. Anyway, the Doctor was actually this super important member of Time Lord history, and they were going to plant hints about this for a few seasons until the big revelation. That didn't happen because the series was effectively cancelled at the end of season 26. And I'm just going to say it, because it's my show, and to quote the Doctor, I can do anything I like. The Cartmel master plan is kind of dumb. It doesn't create new mystery around the Doctor as much as give a definitive answer. And a bad one at that. Because I gotta tell ya, who gives a rat's ass about some important figure in Time Lord history that nobody knew about? I'm one of the biggest Doctor Who fans out there and can make jokes and references to goofy crap nobody remembers, and I can't be bothered to care about that revelation. To quote the Cyber Leader, The secrets of the Time Lords mean nothing to us. Plus, it's taking the anti-authoritarian rebel that was the Doctor, who rejected his society's ethos about non-interference and other races, and turning him into one of the founding fathers of said society. It's just dumb. At least you could argue the Timeless Child revelation allowed for a few storytelling possibilities, as not interesting as those possibilities are. The Cartmel master plan is just a big ol' shrug. Who the Doctor was is not as interesting as who the Doctor is, and that's why no answer to why the Doctor left Gallifrey, his real name, etc., will ever be satisfying. Ironically, they kind of did the Cartmel master plan for Rick Sanchez and Rick and Morty. It worked a lot better there. Doctor Who in this motherfucker! Anyway, the Doctor says that he actually wants the Daleks to have the Hand of Omega, but only the Imperials. The presence of the renegade Daleks completely screwed up his plan, so now they need to hunt it down and prevent them from leaving with it. Speaking of the renegades, as Ratcliffe's men unload the hand, a black Dalek and his forces emerge and exterminate them. Ratcliffe is aghast at this, and here's where we have another subversion of expectations. This being that Ratcliffe is interacting with, the silhouette, the way they talk, and the fact that it's a renegade Dalek faction implies that this is Davros, still on the run from the main Dalek force. You are a slave, Ratcliffe. You were born to serve the Daleks. Sure, you might have been able to guess that the Renegades weren't Davros's Daleks based on their casing colors, but Doctor Who has been making continuity and production mistakes like that for years. Why wouldn't that just be another example of it? Although it does make the fact that the battle computer calls a Dalek nothing more than a machine or a tool kind of odd when it isn't Davros saying that. You'd think their arrogant superiority would make them incapable of downplaying themselves. Like, yes, a machine or tool. The best machine or tools. They slice, they dice, they cube. Exterminate all other kitchen utensils! We'll explain what the deal is with the kids soon enough, but in the meantime, the Black Dalek orders her to activate their time controller. Time controller activated. Calculating coordinates. Man, you know the renegades are hard up on resources when they need to raid Spencer's gifts for their tech. The Doctor somehow discerns where the renegades are and the two sneak in. The Doctor finds the Hand of Omega and speaks to it, saying it knows what it has to do, revealing that, much like the TARDIS, the Hand itself is alive. All these living devices in Time Lord society really need to unionize. Inside Ratcliffe's office, the Doctor explains about the battle computer and why the Daleks are using a child. The Daleks utilize rationality and logic, even their own twisted logic, above all else. The problem is that this makes them single-minded and unable to think outside the box. As such, to break themselves out of that puzzle, they take a child, young, malleable, and above all else, imaginative, and enslave that ingenuity and creativity to the battle computer to design new strategies. It's kind of the equivalent of the old evil overlord list where one of your advisors is a five-year-old child who could determine if your master plan was stupid. However, the Doctor can't deal with that right now. He disables the Dalek time controller to prevent them from leaving until the Imperials can get there. The Black Dalek orders his forces to apprehend whoever disabled the time controller. John Nathan Turner was still the showrunner at the time, and he's been criticized for the number of question marks he featured in the Doctor's outfits and accessories. I strongly disagree with this, because it means the Doctor has the coolest calling card ever that he leaves for the Daleks. Our heroes make a run for it back to the school, encountering Mike along the way, who has been sent out to look for them. They all head back into the school, where Mike is confused why the Daleks haven't just left since they have the Hand of Omega. Thing is, the Doctor hasn't really told the military about the Hand, or that the Renegades have it. So it's revealed that Mike is in league with Ratcliffe and, in turn, the Daleks. This pisses Ace off something fierce, but they can't really worry about that right now as the Daleks attack the school. And I guess the Doctor forgot to give them the disco gun. Even with machine guns, they're outclassed, 
but the Renegades detect the Imperial Daleks' shuttle approaching Earth and call for a retreat to hole up until the time controller is repaired. They're retreating, all of them. Wimps! Ace, I appreciate your moxie, but you're kind of running out of stuff to use against them. I don't know, maybe blind one with your jacket? The Dalek shuttle lands in the school courtyard, the cause of those burn marks, no doubt from when they initially set up the transmat. And that's consequently the cliffhanger of the episode, if you can call it one. Definitely the weakest of the ending moments for the episode, and one of the weakest of the series overall, though still beating out the Doctor reacting with horror to a checkerboard floor. Stop, don't move. The Imperial Daleks head out to attack the Renegades while Gilmore sends everyone else but him and the Doctor downstairs. What do we do? A little bit of piracy. We are going to torrent that shuttle! Mike talks to Ace, trying to reassure her that he didn't know about the Daleks and was just trying to do Mr. Ratcliffe a favor, but all it does is reveal his Nazi leanings. Keep out the outsiders and all. And Ace is not having any of that crap. And neither is Group Captain Gilmore, who says that he's relieved of duty pending investigation of his involvement with their enemy. Meanwhile, the Imperial Dalek Squad encounters two renegade Daleks and a battle ensues. <laughs> You know, for all the jokes people make about Daleks and stairs, they forget that for the superior race of the universe, their aim sucks. I can probably hand wave this encounter because I have to imagine the Daleks would put out some kind of jamming signal that would interfere with targeting, and they have to make several shots to learn to compensate. But still, it's a really frequent problem with the Daleks that unless they're like right in front of you, stormtroopers have a better hit to miss ratio. Anyway, the renegade Daleks are forced into retreat until they bring out their big gun. Quite literally, the special weapons Dalek. It's like they took the idea of the Daleks being tanks to their logical extreme. Expanded universe media suggests that the special weapons Dalek is completely insane because the weapon causes so much excessive radiation that it warps their brain. While the special weapons Dalek has made a couple cameos in New Who, we haven't seen it actually shooting its weapons since then, and that is a damn shame. On a behind the scenes note, this sequence actually caused some problems for the crew. The pyrotechnic explosions were so loud that they were setting off car alarms, and some people thought that there was an IRA bombing happening. This was during the Troubles, after all. Anyway, back to our heroes. Uh, Doctor, I don't think you're gonna be able to hogtie the shuttle. The shuttle has massive ground defenses and an unguarded service hatch on top, so the Doctor plans to have everyone zip line down to it, him first with his utility umbrella. You know, maybe the Daleks shouldn't make their ships out of Doritos. The Doctor disables the Dalek operating the shuttle by playing around with some mini LED lights and invites the others to come down. Meanwhile, Mike escapes his guard to make his way back to Mr. Ratcliffe, where he will somehow arrive before the Imperial Daleks. Figure that one out. Anyway, now that everyone is gathered in the shuttle, the Doctor examines the Daleks' computer, learning that they've returned to Scaro. And that's all they find out. This really needed everyone over here for this trip, I guess. As they leave, he reveals that he's wired some communications equipment to allow them to track the Daleks utilizing parts that they'll cannibalize from the transmat. As the time controller repairs near completion, Ratcliffe whispers to Mike that if they can get their hands on the device, they'll be able to bargain with the Daleks. But before that can happen, the repairs were completed, and the the Black Dalek orders their extermination. Fortunately for them, the Imperials make their entrance. In the chaos, Ratcliffe and Mike run off with the time controller. Unfortunately for them... <laughs> Old fool, only now, at the end, do you understand? The Black Dalek retreats into the warehouse. Wimps! And the special weapons Dalek finishes off the rest of the Renegades allowing them to take the Hand of Omega. Back in the cellar, the Doctor has Ace explain what the deal is between the Imperials and Renegades, and it all boils down to racism. The Imperial Daleks have been further mutated and altered from their original forms, so they're no longer pure to the Renegades, and thus the Civil War. Mind you, I feel like they should have had this explanation before the Renegades got wiped out. Anyway, despite the Doctor spending a bunch of time working on rewiring the transmat into a communication system, he suddenly decides to go off with Ace all the way to Rat Cliff's warehouse to spot Mike moving around with the time controller. He doesn't have time to deal with that, so sends Ace to follow him. Once he returns to the cellar, he tells the group captain that they're not out of the woods yet, but they have his plan. I don't suppose you could let us know what your plan is. No, it ruins the tension with the audience if I say it out loud. As the shuttle returns to the mothership with the Hand of Omega, the Doctor uses his equipment to contact them. This is the Doctor. 
President-elect of the High Council of Time Lords. A less impressive title when you remember that he was deposed when he ran away instead of taking the job. Keeper of the legacy of Rassilon. Which legacy is that? The part where he turns people seeking immortality to stone? Or the records that reveal that vampires are the ancient enemies of the Time Lords? Defender of the laws of time. Depending on how I feel that day. Protector of Gallifrey. You let the Vardens take over Gallifrey that one time! My snarking aside, he orders them to return the Hand of Omega and leave, but the Emperor is unamused, opening up his lid to reveal... Davros. As I said before, the episode played with expectations. Instead of the story being about Davros like the previous Dalek stories had been, this let the Daleks take center stage while Davros still played a part in it. It's unclear how exactly he took control of the Daleks to the point where he is completely in charge when last we saw he was whisked away by them. And I recall reading like an old RPG book when I was a kid that was clearly written before this episode that outlined the full Dalek history and where the Doctor's adventures encountering them took place in their time line, and that one said Davros was killed by them after he was taken, so your guess is as good as mine. The Doctor says that Davros has discarded the last vestige of his human form, which makes me wonder if Davros is supposed to, like, just be a head now or something. Otherwise, he just looks like a dude sitting in a big chair wrapped in wires. Just saying, if that's what they were going for, it is not clear at all. Anyway, Ace catches up to Mike at the boarding house, but he finds her and takes her hostage with a gun. The Doctor demands Davros return the Hand of Omega, but Davros, having gone full mad scientist a long time ago, just rants and rambles about how he'll use it to transform Scaro's son, and the Daleks will become Lords of Time themselves. The Doctor mocks him and this bull that he's heard a million times before. Crush the lesser races! Conquer the galaxy! Unimaginable power! Unlimited rice pudding! Free Netflix subscription can demand the window seat! Never get content ID claimed again! He finally pushes Davros into launching the Hand of Omega at Scaro's son. Presumably through some kind of space-time portal or something, since the Daleks are from the future and it's not like Scaro is right next door or anything. However, the Hand instead causes the sun to go unstable and explode, destroying the entire solar system in the process. You have tricked me! No, Davros. You tricked yourself. Yeah, there's blame to go around. The important thing is that nobody got hurt. Except for the space fascists, because screw them. One of the best aspects of Davros is that for all his bluster, when his ass is on the line, he truly shows how cowardly and craven his mindset is. And in this case, it's because the Hand of Omega is coming right back in the mothership, and it's probably not going to land with them safely. Have pity on me! I have pity for you. I'll send you a get well card in hell, Davros! Davros quickly evacuates, we even see a tiny light going away from the model of the ship, right before the Hand of Omega blows it the hell up. And yep, this had been the plan from minute one of this episode, as the Hand is now programmed to return to Gallifrey, where it'll probably end up being used in the Time War or something, I don't know. The Battle Computer Girl finally catches up with Mike and zaps him with her Force Lightning before turning her attention on Ace. Fortunately, the Doctor and the military have found the Black Dalek, now trapped on Earth in this time period. And here's where we really show off the Seventh Doctor's propensity for dealing with his foes. He lays it all out for the thing. Its forces are gone, it's alone on an alien planet in the wrong time period, its creator is dead, its home planet destroyed, no hope of escape or rescue, and also it just got evicted from its apartment and its parents called to say they never loved it, and its girlfriend has been cheating on it with that hunky mailroom Dalek who used to bully it for months now. In other words, the Black Dalek has had a really bad day, not helped by the fact that it's stuck on a rock or something and is wobbling from side to side. So yeah, the thing gets so confused and horrified by the pointlessness of its own existence and its lack of any hope of getting out of there that it self-destructs, freeing the little girl from the Dalek mind control in the process. While Ace comforts her, the Doctor pokes the Dalek's remains. Ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. If you don't blow yourself up, you're just going to rust. In a rather unusual and different note, the episode does not end in triumphant exultation, but rather a funeral march. Presumably for Mike, since we see his mother with the group captain at the lead of it. And so our episode ends with the Doctor pulling Ace away before they enter. We did good, didn't we? Perhaps. Time will tell. Always does. It's an unusually somber note to end on, especially since... Yeah, Doctor, you did. Daleks destroyed, Nazis knocked on their asses, Time Lord's super weapon not in evil hands anymore. Anyway, despite some weird bits like that, this episode is great. 
If Remembrance of the Daleks has one major flaw, it's that it feels a little too easy for the Doctor. Sure, he's running into difficulties, but he seems to get through those difficulties without much stress, managing to do his thing without a major setback. This plan really only had issues because of the presence of the renegade Daleks, but even then he managed to make it work for him. Ironically, this probably could have been fixed by the presence of Group Captain Gilmore. The story treats Gilmore trusting the Doctor at the beginning of Part 4 like it was a big arc, but that would require Gilmore to actually not acquiesce to some of the Doctor's doctor's demands. After the battle at Totter's Lane, he pretty much does whatever the doctor says despite some minor grumbling. If he had made some decisions that were wrong a few times, caused actual setbacks for the doctor, it would have created more tension in the story, made him a more well-rounded character in general, and made a more complete story arc for their relationship overall. As it stands though, the serial is great, highlighting the seventh doctor at his best, playing against what people expect of him, making good jokes, and getting his enemies to destroy themselves through their own hubris. It has amazing moments, great acting, and two of the best cliffhangers Doctor Who has ever had. The effects team was on point, the writing was on point, and all the performers were given their all. Just a great episode to open Doctor Who's 25th anniversary, and a great start to our own celebration of Doctor Who's 60th. Even though we're starting and ending it late. But let's take a step back from the 25th and go all the way back to the start, as next time we look at the very first Doctor Who comic, The Klepton Parasites. No, no, not his hand, literally. No, no, it's called that because Time Lords have an infinite capacity for pretension. Mm, notice that. Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching.